Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be an interview with Yael from Dark Sword Armory, the president and founder of the company. He takes his time to basically respond to some of the criticisms and questions that I had from the review that I made on the Dark Sword Armory Alexandria that was sent to me for the purposes of review and destruction. I'm doing this quick preface because, uh, well, I didn't give the poor man a chance to introduce himself, which would be customary when doing an interview, and I didn't because I'm not very good or experienced with interviewing. Anyway, uh, he was very generous with his time. I'm very grateful to Dark Sword Armory, Yael, for particular for taking his time to explain and ramble with me about swords for so long. Anyway, I'm going to jump right into it. This is the interview. Here we go. Now, I think I'm officially recording, if I'm still doing it right. Okay. Well, thank you, first of all, for taking time <laughs> to, to talk with me. I much appreciate it. And uh, and there we go. So the, the first thing that I, I'd like to start out with is, I guess, the, the kind of more formal responses to the review I made. You sent me a sword. I, I broke mm -hmm. it, and uh, and I had some thoughts and opinions around that. Hopefully, you've gotten a chance to, to see the review, and uh, and I'm wondering anything that you want to touch on from that review specifically. Um, no, I just think it was a very fair, very honest review. Uh, it showed the pros and the cons to it. Um, you know, um, I had a couple of good laughs at a couple of uh, the parts. Um, Loved your word. What was it? Uh, schmutz or um, schmutz? Some spielkes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so no, I mean, you know, there was nothing, nothing really out there that struck me. I mean, even the quillions breaking and things like that—that that was perfectly fine with me. Um, it's something that I'm going to look at, of course, but it also is. A destruction test. I mean, the purpose really is to break the sword. It's to destroy it, to push it to the limit, and that's the whole point of a destruction test. So I really didn't have any issues whatsoever with the video. Um, you know, and, uh, no, great. That's well, that's good to hear. I didn't, I didn't yeah. uh, mess anything up too bad. Well, I mean, the, the, to your point, the purpose was to mess it up. So uh, the the Quillians, I suppose, are the the one that I've gotten the most feedback on community wise. And as a as a non practitioner of Hema myself, I don't. I don't particularly use the quillions for anything other than bumping myself in the head inadvertently, to which I would say thank you for making them not sharp. But uh, they did, a lot of people have said if this were used in, in HEMA practice or it were, if they were perhaps using the dull version and, and for its intended purpose, that a, a, a well, <laughs> a forceful strike would uh, not leave their hands with a lot of protection. Do you think that the, the quillions on the sword stood up to the punishment that you would expect, or when you say you're going to look at it, is it is it not up to par? Uh, uh, I'm going to look at it in the sense that uh, for sure that when uh, you did the test, uh, the way it's set up, it's not exactly the same impact as you would have if you were actually using it. Because, for example, when you're using a sword and you're blocking, you know, uh, let's say you're using the pillions to block, the incoming blow obviously will have an impact on your body and you will retract as opposed to the way that we have it set up, let's say in a destruction test like yours, you have it set up or if you have it set up on a vice and you just hit it down, there's no movement. It's static. You're sort of static. So there's no damper of the shock. Yeah. Whereas if you're holding it and you're damp your body will automatically damper and dissipate that shock throughout the sword and your body as opposed to just having it on a vice or the way you had it set up where there's absolutely no movement. So, is it fair? Yes, it was fair in the sense that it was a destruction test. Is it 100% representative of face-to-face uh, -face combat? No, it's not. But at the same time, it is something that I would look into with the casting company, uh, the people who do our castings for the guards and palms and let him determine what exactly can be done in order to strengthen that. Definitely. Yeah, the, uh, I, I don't know from a scientific perspective, because what I'm, what I'm doing in terms of testing, testing is such an unfair word, because it implies some sort of scientific methodology, which is certainly not in place by kind of jankily propping the sword in with a log and then beating it with another sword-like <laughs> object, right? That's, it's, it's certainly not analogous to combat, to okay. practice, to, to anything like that. Um, that said, I, I don't know how much force, uh, it's not quite a device, it was kind of this metal drum, which was formerly a water heater, kind of stuck in the ground yeah. and then propped up with a log. So there's some movement, but not as much as a human body would. But I'm also striking with 
with a, a club like sword in a kind of not the, not with nearly as much force as a as an opponent trying to cleave your head off would right so uh, so th there's less strength in the force but less less movement and and where it is and how that scientifically works out to would would you survive if this were a were a combat strike um, I I don't know I, I do know it's not a fair test but at the same time it seems like those broke a little easier and they should have bent is that seems to be communally what people are saying is preferably they would have bent deformed rather than fly off exactly yes uh, and that is the purpose that's why you make them with mild steel you, you do want them to bend as opposed to break so uh, and yeah that that's definitely um, from the video itself that was really one thing that I took out of the video um, the quillions you know. so definitely we, we will be looking into it that said I mean so far we haven't had well you know, we've been around for we're going to be 25 years in September. Uh, we opened in September of 1996, and in 25 years, I think we had like a handful of broken billions that we had to replace, you know, uh, fix up, things like that. So it hasn't been too bad. I mean, I, I'm pretty proud of the product we put out. But, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's always room for improvement, and uh, we'll definitely look into that, yeah. That's, that's fair. Uh, you know, it, in all the swords that I collect, I don't know how many people when they buy them actually use them. I certainly, in, in terms of the swordsmanship style that I study, don't really ever have much impact when it comes to the the guard. Most of it's like a Japanese or Filipino style martial arts, so there's not not as much in there uh, for for absorbing impact on a, on a cross guard. Uh, but it's it's not it's something somebody asked me to test and I hadn't just I hadn't even really thought about, <laughs> about how to do that. Um, still it, it does seem Seem like it's, it certainly warrants warrants a look. If if someone were to have this problem and say, "Hey, I, I was using the sword for sword-like activities, and this broke," is that something from a warranty perspective that a customer would expect you to take care of, or or how would that situation be handled? Uh, anything that happens with our swords. I mean, our swords are fully uh, under warranty. So no matter what happens, whether it's the blade, billions, anything at all. Uh, we take it back, we repair it. Basically what we do is that we send a FedEx uh, pickup tag. So it goes under our account, the customer doesn't pay anything. All he has to do is pack up the sword, call FedEx for the pickup, comes under our account, we either fix it or replace it all together, send it back to the customer. So that's absolutely not an issue. And I, I did hear some folks question, um, one of the questions that came up is the edge sharpness that you have. And I, uh, I am admittedly not a good edge putter on her. Uh, <laughs> very technical term. Similar to schmutz. Um, I, I'm not very good at sharpening the swords. I was able to do it. Uh, somebody had noted that if it's not coming terribly sharp and they need to sharpen it, that that may have some impact on, on your ability to service it or warranty it. Is that the case? No. No. Unless the person uses an angle grinder or something crazy like that and you completely destroy the blade, I mean, we'll, we'll still take it back and we'll fix it. Uh, to their uh, best of our abilities, depending on how bad the blade is. But, I mean, you know, it's, uh, we, we recognize that people, I mean, of course, people are going to use them. I mean, most of our clients are members of the backyard cutting uh, subculture, basically. They go in the backyard and start cutting things. So, of course, they're going to be used. And that doesn't affect the warranty. The only thing that will affect the warranty is if the customer takes it apart and starts, you know, wants to heat treat it or something and starts wants to modify it, things like that. So I see. So, so like yeah, we'll still take it back and we'll still work on it and things like this, but depending on what he did, you know, there might be some fees, but uh, we never left a client basically get down and say, Well too bad for you. That that just doesn't happen. That that didn't seem to be <laughs> consistent with some of the feedback I got. Okay. Would you would you argue that uh, the, the times you're not replacing something or refunding a client's purchase is because there's modification done either. You mentioned an angle grinder. Uh, I could certainly see with my limited experience sharpening that if I did much other than the 600 or 1000 grit sandpaper that was on my, my little hodgepodge of a belt sander, uh, that you'd remove material and, and fundamentally alter something. Uh, so much so that you couldn't repair it and, and resell it. It wouldn't it wouldn't be able to be brought back to new or so, something to that extent. So, w would you say when you're when you're not offering that service that it's because something has has been done to modify or 
or uh, diminish the product in a way that it's... Um, it's very rare that we haven't offered that service. Um, I'm trying to think um, the situation where we refuse to refund a customer. Um, when they are used, I mean, and something does happen, we will not refund the customer. We will fix it or replace it. Um, but we won't refund for a sword that has been used and damaged somehow. Um, if it's about, hmm, if it's about return and the customer misused, I mean, I don't, I don't know. What, what sort of comments did you get? Uh, because I can't think of any. Um, yeah, well, I, in fairness, right, um, oh, yeah, you sell a lot of product. You've been in business for a long time. And people that are upset are often very vocal and not shy about posting on YouTube. So I don't expect you to recollect every single situation. And you've already spoken to kind of your policy on warranty. <laughs> so I, I think that's that's fair enough. If you're curious, though, I mean, I, the comments are public yeah. on, on YouTube. So I, I do recall... A few frustrated people that were not overly enthusiastic about your response from a customer service perspective. That said, okay. I'm I'm not involved in the situation. <laughs> Don't see the same thing no you do. Uh, that said, it, it seemed to be uh, the question was around, "Hey, I've sharpened the sword and I wasn't able to to get service." And what you're saying here seems to be that that's not the case. If you sharpen it and something's flawed, you won't get your money back, but we'll fix your sword. Absolutely. Okay. I'm actually surprised to hear that, and I would suggest that the person contact me directly, and I will look into it. Uh, that's a first. I mean, I haven't heard of somebody not getting customer service because he sharpened his sword. Okay. Well, if, if that gentleman is listening, then, then hopefully you'll get an email. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, there were a myriad of other questions around there, and I know some of it was around service. Uh, and you know what to expect if if the sword is used, and I, I think you've you've answered that. Um, is there anything in terms of service that that you think is is maybe left out of the conversation, or something that you do that maybe people don't know about? Uh, yes, because I find that there's a lot of disinformation um, on forums about uh, our service. Um, for one, I mean. Um, Sorry, because, I mean, this is news to me. Someone sharpens a sword and can't get, uh, have it fixed or somehow. But in any event, um, one thing I find very frust frustrating is the fact that I pride myself with uh, what I think is very good customer service. Um, as a matter of fact, we take swords back like, three, four years later for servicing, you know, polishing or sharpening again, and we do that free of charge. Um, so I'm kind of surprised when I hear people criticize us about having really bad customer service because I don't know of any company who does that. Um, you know, that's that's it's that's nothing for us. That's no big deal. I mean, customers who have purchased a sword from us like five years later can send us the sword for polishing again, for resharpening, and there's no fee for it. It's free. Um, so there's no reason for us not to take a sword that has been purchased and sharpened by the customer and not give him the same service. Um, where, where I mentioned that it's a little problematic when the customer uses an angle grinder. Sometimes we've seen in the past like one or two episodes where somebody uses an angle grinder and completely deforms the blade, you know, kind of like, while waving. And that's very difficult to work at because you have to take the lowest point and basically balance it out. So what you're left off with is a very narrow blade, and that could be an issue. Uh, but that's something we would do anyways. You know, we wouldn't replace it for a new one, but we would definitely fix it for the client, or attempt to anyway. <laughs> as, much, as much as we could, yeah. But I mean, you know, I'm kind of surprised to hear things like this because it's all on our FAQ page. So all people have to do is go on our on our own website um, instead of listening to what someone believes is the situation at, at the art store. And I find that um, whenever I see these things, you know, my initial reaction is to go into our accounting. You know, if the name is there, kind of type up his name and see what exactly happened. You know, what did he order? Uh, when? What happened? And... Um, you know, that's that's my first step. Um, 
but it's just, you know, I'm kind of like speechless when I hear about customer service issues like this because I'm really surprised. Honestly, really surprised. So, Well, that's, I, I don't think you can do much more as a, as a company than throw the olive branch out and offer, I mean, if you offer polishing and sharpening services years later, free of charge, presumably if it's not a warranty issue or something that's your fault, you you need to send it back on your own on your own well, time. Um, yeah, absolutely. But that's still, I think, a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, and again, in fairness, it sounds like you, you offer this service and perform it, and as a third party with YouTube comments to go off of, it, there's, we're not talking about a, a specific situation that I'm personally involved in or have details on. It's it's yeah. a bit of hearsay, you might say. That, say, that said, um, you know, I, I can certainly think of customer service situations I've had where when you start the conversation off with uh, expletives and, and, and unkindness, it can be easy to, to not finish that, <laughs> that service interaction. So I don't know. I, I can't say exactly why that's happening. But if anyone is, is having a problem with your product and is watching this video now, then it sounds like you, you have extended the olive branch to, to get that sword fixed and worked on if it's your product. Well, that's uh, that's good enough on the I think on the warranty side of things. Uh, the other bit I had was around the the hollow ground part on the yeah. Alexandria piece. Uh, how much do you think a hollow grind uh, plays a role in the effectiveness against you know different targets and different cutting methods? How how do you see that playing out in actual application? Well, when you hollow ground a blade. Um you're stiffening up the blade, so there's less, less flex to it. So it will be better in terms of thrusting a weapon. Um, in terms of comparison with a standard fullered blade, in terms of uh, durability, it's to be tested. I mean, there's, I've never tested it. I mean, you would need some very serious equipment, scientific equipment, to test how much pressure one can take as opposed to the other. Um, suffice it to say that, I mean, both are the most important thing with your blade is heat treating and tempering. Um, you know, the only thing with hollow ground as opposed to fuller blade really is the amount of flexibility you get. So, you know, and then of course, there's that component of the use. What type of use do you want it for? Is it more of a slashing weapon? Is it more of a thrusting weapon? So, so, I mean, to answer that question, is it better, or worse, solid? You know, it's 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 very difficult to determine exactly scientifically how much better, how much more resistant it would be for a particular use. It looks cool. I <laughs> I love uh, you know I love hollow ground. I mean, which is the reason why I decided to make it because um, the Alexandria sword is not on a hollow ground blade. Um, I decided to do so just because of my personal bias. I just love them. Um, same way I added a pin, pin block on top of the pommel. The Alexandria sword does not have a pin. I just think aesthetically it's a lot nicer, a lot more appealing. Um, so those are little little things that I prefer. You know, So when I design something, I, I like it to be interesting to myself. I mean, because it's my product. I want to be happy with it. And... I hope that what I see, my vision, will appeal to other people. Um, so you have different makers, obviously, making uh, their interpretation of the piece. Some of them are purists and keep it, you know, 100% accurate or close to it. While I prefer taking a little bit of artistic liberty uh, with my pieces, and uh, you know, uh, that's all it is. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I did have a conversation with somebody a little bit more historically. Uh, mm -hmm. apt than, than I did and he, that, that was uh, Sebastian from, from I Post Swords and he, uh, he is, is quite a bit more of a student of history than I am and noted that it didn't seem that hollow ground blades didn't exist in that profile just that the one you're, you're happening, happening to use as, uh, as inspiration didn't have that feature but I, I don't exactly. think it's you made a lightsaber or something completely ahistoric in, in, the, in the journey No, so, that's it, I mean what I, what I did with the um, I used inspiration, but I kept the, um, the essence of the sword, if you will. Um, you know, so the, the spirit of the sword. That's what's important to me. Um, when I deviate from historical models, I don't want to go into the fantasy realm. 
you know, I want to keep it historical, but I will take some creative liberties with the design. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And in terms of the the spirit of the sword, I've I've had a few different Type 18C blades that I've I've moved around. In your mind, what is the spirit of that sword? What's it for? What, what's what's it supposed to feel like? Um, I think that uh, our version of it. I'm sorry, I can't compare it with other manufacturers because I haven't tried them. Uh, but I feel that ours is very close to the original. Uh, I have had the pleasure of handling the original at the Met. I was lucky enough. Um, the original is quite a bit lighter, uh, nine ounces lighter, if I remember correctly. Um, it does feel the point of balance is closer to the guard. Uh, really is a remarkable piece, it's stunning. Um, so it's it's really close to it, but what I look for is not only the feel, but it's also the aesthetics of it. Uh, just with a little bit of embellishment and a little variations, but what's what's important though is the feel of it. You know, how does it handle? How, how do you feel handling the piece? And that that's really important. How does it compare to the original? To a certain point, uh, because like I said, I'm not a purist. I'm not looking to reproduce the piece in its entirety. So. I'm not one to nitpick about, well, the original was about five or six ounces lighter and things like that and point of balance because there's a lot of things that go into play. It's the type of steel that you're using. You know, you can't say that, okay, well, you need to be historically accurate. You need to be a purist and the sword weighs, let's say, three pounds, nine ounces. And it, this is the dimension and you have to be exactly the same. Well, if you keep the same dimension, same profile of the blade, same guard, pommel weight, and everything, you're still, you're never going to achieve that because the alloy, the composition was very different back then than it is today. Today we buy the steel from the, you know, refinery. Everything comes into us, all the impurities are already sucked out. Um, so it wasn't the same as forging a blade during the 15th or 16th century, completely different. So it's very difficult to say that the original was, let's say, three pounds, nine ounces, and my goal is to make three pounds nine ounces, because already you're working with raw material that's very different. Um, so, and that's really not my, my goal. Uh, you know, that's that was never what I was after. Um, in uh, 25 years of business, Dark Sword was never in it in order to purely make purest swords, and that's not how I advertise them either. You know, they're not 100% historical reproductions. They're inspired by, with little design changes to them. And, you know, and that's fair. And I can I can certainly see your point of uh, if your if your materials are at, at a base level different than uh, than the piece you're trying to historically recreate. Just from where you're starting, there's already enough variation that you're never going to be able to really achieve the goal. Of, of making something 100% the, the same. Um, taking artistic liberties and preserving the spirit. The, the curious part of the question, though, is is what do you think the, the spirit of that sword is? If it's not the exact measurements or exact aesthetics or exact point of balance or exact materials, uh, what are you trying to capture with, with that particular piece? For me, it's the history. Um, the Alexandria sword has a uh, very rich history, and I actually we actually made a video about that on YouTube, uh, going to the his historical background of the piece uh, and why the Alexandria is so important for me. I mean, uh, the Alexandria is a piece that I saw oof, very long time ago. It was probably like nine or no, not nine. It was probably like eleven or twelve years old uh, when I saw it at the Met the first time, um, and it just spoke to me. Uh, there's something about it, the dimensions, just the, the clean, how clean the design is. Um, of course, as a, as a child, I didn't look into the historical context of the sword, uh, but there's a lot of historical meaning into that sword because it was a diplomatic gift. So when you're dealing with the history of the Middle Ages and going into diplomacy, that history becomes much more profound, much deeper. Um, and especially the fact that it's a very interesting sword, sword in the sense that it's a European design, it's an Italian design, yet it's got some Arabic uh, engraving on it because it was this diplomatic uh, gift. 
uh, which makes it really interesting because it's very rare. I mean, we don't see this in any, as far as I know, any other uh, European source other than the ones found at the um, Alexandria Arsenal. So, and that's what that's what's really interesting about that piece. Despite you know, put aside the design in itself, which is absolutely beautiful. So yeah, that okay. that the meaning for me with the Alexandria design. So is it if I if I'm understanding correctly, then when you say spirit, like inherently, I think that means uh, if if you were to hold uh, the original and hold mm -hmm. the piece that you made, well, you'd of course be able to tell they're different things. Um, as you move them around, they would they would share more similarities than differences. Yeah. But it, from a historical perspective, I suppose that's different. If somebody were to, to hold this mm. object in their hand or have it on their wall or keep it in their collection, you're hoping that there's there's some sort of tie to that, the history that inspired the object rather than the dynamic properties that that object might have. It's a mixture of both. Um, like I said, the our versions of the Alexandria sword is close to the original. It's not identical. Uh, because of many, many factors, including the steel type and so forth, but also because we changed the design a little bit. Uh, so there are many factors that will contribute to the um, to the discrepancies in weights, for example, or the handling characteristics. Um, so there's that aspect itself, but there's also the historical aspect. When you speak of the uh, spirit of the sword, or at least for, for me, I mean, this is just my personal point of view. On it's your product, so it's a pretty important point of view. You yeah. know, you're the yeah. one who makes it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it's a combination of both. Um, you can't just put out a Type 18C and say, here, this is the Alexandria sword. You know, there has to be something about it, not just the history behind it, but there has to be something objective about it handling design uh feel of it balance that needs to be close to it and that's why i think so many people so many manufacturers do make the alexandria sword but they all have different designs uh in the sense the grip and so forth i mean you know um matthew uh, zalarski uh, also makes an alexandria sword which is absolutely stunning um, I think right now he is at the top of the game in the sword community. I think he makes the the most beautiful and definitely the best swords on the market right now. Um, his pieces are absolutely stunning. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, if you compare Dark Sword to his sword, you know, you will see some differences, um, whether it's the pommel, uh, the grip, because he is more of a purist, obviously, than we are. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a stunning piece. Well, that... That's very. You you noted earlier that many of your customers are are backyard cutters, enthusiasts that will Correct. use the swords in in backyard shenanigans, if you will. And so, uh, how much do you think that plays a part? I mean, obviously you're you're in a business and you mass produce swords, and you have a customer base that that uses them, and you're probably very familiar with what they're they're wanting out of you because that's that's how you buy your supper. Um, but a person that's using it in the backyard is is probably different than somebody who's looking for an exact historical recreation that the, yep. the customer and what they intend to do with the sword and how they intend to use it are probably different. How much does that play a factor in the swords that you design? Because it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but uh, if you're not using it in the context of, of some sort of historical drill or you're not, you're not practicing chemo or some sort of martial art and you're, you're having fun in the backyard, uh, there, it's it's more abusive just by nature, right? Your your edge alignment may not be as good because there's there's nobody kind of rasping you over the knuckles saying do it this way. Um, are you intentionally maybe overbuilding the products, making them more durable, which by nature affects the dynamics? Uh, I'm rambling here, but does that play a part into how you design your swords and how close to the originals you can get? Yeah, no, it's a, it's actually a good question, good comment because uh, I've seen that online. I mean, we've been criticized for overbuilding and underbuilding you know we've been kind of attacked for both sides of the spectrum uh but no that that uh, has absolutely no bearing on um our designs or anything because all of our swords are built the same way anyways um so it, that's not an that's not something i look into we have clients basically are mainly backyard cutters we do have customers who actually use them and uh we have a small portion of customers that are actually either 
anthropology professors or uh, history professors and stuff like that who, you know, a couple of them I have conversations on the phone for hours because I really enjoy speaking with them. Uh, but uh, so we have uh, clients from a little bit all over the place in terms of the spectrum. Um, but um, I don't think that our sword, when, and I'm making reference to the Alexandria, I don't think that it's so different from the original that it will cause it from being non-historical. I mean, it's still, uh, it still embodies the spirit of the Alexandria with minor changes, you know. Uh, the handling is very uh, is very similar. Um, the pommel is very different in the sense that we have a peen block. It's not as thick. Uh, little aspects like that. The guard is also a little bit different in the sense that it doesn't have that diamond shape in the center of it. You know, little changes that we decided to make, um, not only from a design point of view, but also to be different from what's already been done, even if though it's an historical piece. I still want it to be a little bit different from what other people have put on the market because I am very aware that people will criticize that, well, you can't do this because this company has already put that product out, even though it's a historical model. So I do make changes on that end in order to mitigate these uh, criticisms. Um, but that said, what's important for me really is to keep the uh, sense of the history kind of the spirit of that particular piece and not going too much into the fantasy realm or at all. Uh, in terms of designing to for our customer base, that doesn't... Uh, I mean, I've always worked in the sense that what appeals to me, you know, is ultimately what's going to make people happy, or at least I assume. You know, um, I never go out of my way to make a sword that I don't like simply to sell it. Um, we've gotten we've gotten a lot of requests for the Zelda sword. A lot. A lot. Um, there was a point where we would get one custom request a week. And this lasted for like five, six months. And this was up to until two years ago. Um, I don't know if there was a Zelda convention or something. And people were saying, you know, I'll pay you $2,000. This is my budget. You know, $2,000. If I wanted to make easy money, I'd do it. But it's not. It's something I'm really not interested in. So uh, no, no Zelda designs, thank you very much. Um, it's not my thing. But what does sell more, what I guess what resonates most with clients are definitely uh, fantasy pieces. I mean... People love the Excalibur sword, for example. That's a very good seller, you know. Uh, the Warmonger, excellent seller. But I do make a couple of fantasy pieces, like the Warmonger. Uh, that was one of them that I worked with Terry, uh, one of our designers. Was inspired by a door knocker I saw in Paris. Uh, they had a beautiful door knocker, a huge door knocker with two snakes, intertwining snakes, with the heads just kind of pointing towards each other with the mouth open and I just looked at it and that was beautiful, it's huge, it's a massive thing and I took a picture of it and I was just, I don't know what I'm going to do with that but, you know, I just want to do something with it and I showed it to Terry and I said, what, what can we do, what can we come up with with that and the warmonger took like two or three years uh, to put out because it was such a complicated thing just to think about and be creative and, uh, you know, come up with um, and one of the challenges is that not to make it, when you're dealing with snakes and you're dealing with a fantasy piece, not to get trapped into that Conan the Barbarian thing, you know, where your piece looks way too much, way too close to, to the Conan's work. You know, we didn't want to be trapped into that. So to answer your question, no, it's never about making a product simply for sales. Like this design will equal so many sales because... That's never how I worked. That's not my intention. And even Dark Short, I mean, 25 years later, I mean, I consider myself really, really lucky. I mean, I never imagined that Dark Short would be what it is today. I never imagined. I never even thought about having employees and things like this. This is just one big, like, lucky charm. Boom, you know. I started Dark Short when I was a university student, uh, just as a hobby. You know, it's like I was still living in my mother's house. Um, 
you know, it was in 1997. I was one of the few online. I was one of the first. I think we were like five or six online back then. It's, um, I suppose let me let me steer the question in a in in sure. the in the direction when I say build for your consumer. Obviously, I understand what you're saying about the Zelda sword and how fantasy pieces resonate. I suppose uh, if I go back to a um, an experience I had at the Oakshot Institute, I got to see the the Moonbrand sword, which is uh, a famous kind of arming arming sword that I've I've seen a lot of pictures of and people have tried to replicate. And I've gotten a hold of a few pieces that were, you know, inspired by by that that sword. And holding it in my hand, um, I can see that it, it it gets to be a millimeter thick, and it's it's bent and it's obviously old and, and diminished in terms of. Uh, it's conditioned, but it's it's very thin and, and presumably always was. And so I think as a person like you, with employees, with a company, with a, what seems like a very generous warranty policy of, I'll fix your sword if you swing it at stuff. Uh, if you make a blade that's a millimeter thin, you know, that, that's not going to survive. Uh, potentially no, even some water bottles, right? Like the, a, a rigid sword with a lot of flex and bad edge alignment is a, is a recipe for <laughs> for a lot of warranty claims. And so as I look at swords on the production market now, very often they tend to be thicker than the historical counterparts that inspired them. And part of me thinks, well, that might be ease of manufacturing, but the other part of me thinks, well, I'm, I'm kind of a ditz that swings things around in my backyard too. How much of this is to avoid the potential fallout of, of the sword breaking? Okay. Because you know yeah. they're in inexperienced hands. Okay, I understand what you're, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, I can't speak for other manufacturers. We definitely don't. I mean, I haven't, uh, I haven't encountered too many swords one millimeter. There are some rapiers, yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, in terms of actual, might be hyperbole on my part, but it's real thin. Let's. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, pro probably not a millimeter. No. If I'm if I'm being very clear, I don't think it's actually a millimeter, but it is. No, no, it is I quite mean, thin. I think let's say two millimeters or whatever it was, but I mean, you know, I, I understand. Um, no, it's not something that uh, we don't build them, you know, to a crazy degree. I mean, you know, if you look at some of our blades, they're like approximately 2.5, 2.6 millimeter thick. Um, we don't necessarily go out of our way to make them super thick, overbuilt, if you will. Um, we just, it's um you don't go your way to overbuild them yeah we just make them in an appropriate fashion so that the point of balance still remains true to the historical piece as much as possible and still be functional uh, mm -hmm. for sure there are uh, instances uh today you know uh, hema alliance and so forth where they need them to be thicker but those are completely separate uh, from our standard line. I mean, we do also make uh, WMA swords, uh, but those are much bigger. Um, you're going into three or four millimeter thick uh, with rounded off edges and so forth, specifically made for that. So yes, those are overbuilt for a purpose. But um, no, I mean, we, we try to uh, stay more or less, you know, um, similar to the original um, counterparts. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I constantly buy antiques, antique swords to study them. Um, so it's just, Fair enough. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, standard. Yeah. And you mentioned, and again, yeah, I don't have much experience with other brands, so I don't know the thickness of uh, their swords. So you probably have more experience than I do with that aspect of it. Well, that's, that's fair. The, uh, the examples that I saw were, uh, a myriad of different people trying to replicate it and as I see photos or as I get to handle them just habitually they they tend to be thicker um, and I didn't yeah. realize that until I, I had the the pleasure of seeing the original uh, and I it kind of dawned on me that if if someone were to attempt to reproduce this on mass and sell it with a warranty that that would be you know if, if somebody's understands that this is this is a, an object of finesse and that it, it's it's expected to break if you whack it into something hard but it's also expected to cut really well if, if you're using it on the appropriate target <laughs> that uh, that you can't necessarily expect that from your customer. You don't know what they're going to use it for. A lot of pieces from various manufacturers seem to be thicker than the, the historical pieces. 
Yeah. Not, not always, yeah. but in, in many cases that tends yeah. to be there. I mean, uh, we try to keep them as uh, similar as possible to the originals, uh, but definitely there, w there will be a difference. Like I said, there will be a difference, and this will directly affect your point of balance, directly affect your, the weight distribution and so forth, uh, I mean, the, the total weight of the piece. Um, that said, I mean, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, people, we have, we're used to doing things within modern society in the sense that we go on forums, we're part of the for, uh, sword community and so forth. So, for example, um, it was uh, about two summers ago, I went to see a HEMA group in um, Barrie, Ontario. And um, I brought all of my antiques with me. And we're all looking at them, you know, pulling out the swords, stuff like that. And one guy took one of my rapiers and did a flex test. And I was like, <laughs> you know, you don't do that with antiques, you know, but it just goes with what we're used to. Um, so definitely, yeah, there, there will be some discrepancies between the way you handle an antique and that, an authentic sword as opposed to a modern day version of. And that's because of many, mid, many different things. The use, the intended use, um, when you're cutting in your backyard as opposed to actually being in thick battles, you know, it's very different. But also because, again, the raw material. What do we have today as opposed to back then? You know, it's, it's, it's completely different. You, you can't compare both uh, products the same way at 100%. And that's why my goal is never to, not necessarily, uh, to produce 100% historical reproduction of a piece in terms of point of balance, in terms of weight, because there's no real point to that. I mean, um, like I said, the raw material itself will lend itself to the final uh, weight of your piece, as long as it keeps the spirit of the piece in terms of the handling, the point of balance, as far as I'm concerned, you're fine. Uh, what's important is that you do your best. You know, you do your Uh-oh. We'll be right back due to technical difficulties. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. You were, um, but I, I think you, you've kind of answered the question that you're not, you're not specifically overbuilding anything because you want them to be more durable for your clients. You're, you're just making the swords as you want to make them. And if the product is heavier than some might like, then, then, then that's just not the product for them. Absolutely. I mean, I, I personally, I don't think like three or four ounces will really make a difference. Um, it's bottom line. Really. That's the bottom. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I've, uh, I've certainly played with, with swords where the, well, let me say, I've, I've had the same sword. There's a particular sword that I'm, I'm a big fan of. Uh, and and I, I bought it, and I was like, wow, um, I, I, this is perfect for me. I love it. it I, it's going to go on the ground with me. But I'm probably going to break this one because I'm dumb. I'm going to use it, and, and the byproduct of using these things, eventually they're just going to diminish to a point where it doesn't justify the repair. But it happened to be a mass-produced thing, and I thought, well, I can just go get another one. They're mass produced. I, I have the luxury of buying a second one. But the second one wasn't the same. And neither was the third or the fourth or the fifth. None of them were the same. In fact, the one that I have is a bit of a freak show where it's several ounces heavier. But that that slight difference is, is what makes it magic to me. And I've been unable to buy another one because there's there's enough variation. Now, that, that speaks to a different problem in variation and manufacturing, and, and that's a different topic. But suffice to say that general same shape, general same sh size, but a few ounces spread over the blade um, can, can, certainly, can certainly make a difference. To some people, you know, uh, you know if, they're, if, they haven't tr if they're not trying to make something exactly, that feels exactly the same, they probably won't run into that issue. And three or four ounces might, might kind of dissipate over the blade in a, in a less meaningful way. But uh, if, if you're... Uh, really anal retentive about it, I suppose you'll notice. <laughs> well, look, I mean, uh, yeah, but that's just the way it is for us, you know. That's fair. Least, now, you, that's you've fair. also noted that you get criticized for overbuilding and underbuilding, and, and based on the commentary that I read, the overbuilding side was above the hilt on the blade section. Folks thought they were maybe too thick, overbuilt, and, and to your credit, you mm -hmm. already answered that question in the sense that you're making the sword you want to make, and if it's it's not be we're not you're not doing it intentionally or to to spite anything or for any kind of 
a maniacal reason. You're just making the sword you want to make. The underbuilt thing seems to come from the, the other side, uh, below the hill. The Tang specifically seems to be yeah. where folks are criticizing you for being underbuilt. And I've, I've seen some photos that suggest that mm-hmm. in, in the past or in the present, I'm, I'm not sure. I've seen photos of your products anyway with tanks that seem to be insufficient. Absolutely. And what yeah. would you say to the, the folks that have that criticism? Is it Are they right to? Are you... Yeah, they're they're right. They're right. There was um, actually there's a blog article on our website, so anyone can go there and look at it. Um, this is something that happened in 2016, and it is what the criticism was legit, um, and I take the full blame for it as the business owner. Um, we had one, and as I explained in the blog, uh, we had an employee back in 2016 who I've had for three years. And then in 2016, I'm not quite sure what happened, I'm not quite sure if he had personal issues in his own life or whatever the situation was, but his uh, workmanship was greatly diminished. Um, instead of uh, slotting the grips appropriately in order to fit the tangs, he was grinding down the tangs to make his job easier and slide them into the grips. Um, so. And of course, I mean, I do the final quality control, and I still do, even after 25 years, I still do the final quality control on our pieces prior to shipping out. And obviously, being built, I did not see the tanks on those pieces. Um, that lasted approximately three months. So for a three-month period in 2016, that individual was making what I have to say was shoddy work. Um, I did my best to uh, recall those swords. We did replace them. Um, so it was something that w- was very isolated, but for sure, yeah, it, it's something that we screwed up on. Um, you know, and unfortunately, it's never easy, but I did have to let him go uh, because of that, which was never a fun situation. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, we rectified the problem, we replaced those swords, and that has never happened since. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but we were always very honest about it. We wrote a blog article about it, it's still on our uh, forum, uh, sorry, it's still on our uh, blog page, on our website. Um, we uh, posted pictures of the shoddy uh, tanks, um, so anyone can go on our website, go into the blog, and read exactly what happened and what we did in order to uh, counter the problem and correct those swords, you know, replace them and so forth. So that's something that's in the past. Unfortunately, of course, there are critics, I don't know why, that keep on, you know, bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back. Yes, it was three years ago. I messed up. Yes. There's there's a, a few different levels, I think, to that, that criticism, right? So you have, you have the folks in it. It's safe to say that you tried to recall those swords and that if, if one comes out today and they say, hey, my, my sword came apart or I was taking it apart to customize it and this is this is what was underneath, would yeah. you offer replacement services for those customers? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I think that that, that kind of answers that question. About specifically like the, the little kind of rat-tailed tangs that you might see in the photos. Yeah. But even with the Alexandria sword, there were folks that said that the tang on this was smaller than it should be, that it wasn't as it was a quarter inch thinner than it, that were thicker anyway. There's something in the comments about it being small. Uh, in fairness, uh, you, you saw what I did to the thing, and uh, and it didn't break. <laughs> so, exactly. To, to me, that that seems like it's sufficient. Um, but even when you're making swords now, do you think that you? You underbuild the tang, could they be thicker than they are? Or why are they the size that they are? Because they don't need to be any thicker than that, any wider than that. That's that's my natural reaction to that. I mean it's perfectly fine. You did a really good destruction test, you know, a couple of a uh, couple of times when I watched the video, it's kinda like, ooh, you know, because you really pushed it to the limit. And again, that was the purpose of it. And the sword handled quite well. So why overbuild it? You know, and if it is overbuilt, then I'll be criticized for overbuilding a sword. And then you add more uh, tank thickness, more tank width, you're adding more weight. Then people are going to criticize about, you know, a couple of ounces more here and there. So, I mean, the criticism could come from anywhere. Uh, anywhere. Um, the only thing you can do is 
build the best possible product that you can build and be proud of what you put out. People criticize anyways. The best company in the world you know, is criticized. It, it doesn't matter what you put out. There will always be some criticism. What's important is that the bulk of your customers are really happy, that you're proud of the product you're putting out, you know you're putting out a good product, and you stand by your product and customers. That's really important, and th those are the elements. Uh, I realize that my swords are not for anything, um, and that's fine. It's perfectly fine. I don't feel that I need to beef them up even more than what they are now. I mean, I, I think that they're really good the way they are, of course, there's always room for improvement. Uh, I think in 25 years, Dark Sword has made a lot of improvements. Because, I mean, I do get, like I said, I do get swords back uh, for polishing, touch-ups, and, you know, sharpening. And when I, sometimes I get swords that we made like 10, 15 years ago. And I love when that happens because I look at it, wow, holy crap, we improved. You know, and I'm not crapping on what we did back then because it was the best that we were able to do back then. But we've made a lot of improvement and so have a lot of other manufacturers. I think all the manufacturers or most of the manufacturers have improved over the years. And that's because we have more information now than we used to. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I wasn't able to go see. I didn't have any contacts with curators because it wasn't that easy to speak to a curator. There was a lot of red tape around. Uh, today, when you're a researcher, you know, uh, museums have kind of changed, have tweaked their role in society. I think someone realized, I mean, a light bulb just flashed and they realized that we're an educational tool. We should be more open to the public. So it's a lot easier to have access to the back end collection, you know, as long as you have a valid reason to be there. As long as you own a sword company. <laughs> uh, yeah, or you're doing research. research. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know it's, um, so I mean, you know, it, and that that goes a long way, not only for dark Turk, but for a lot of manufacturers. You know, uh, I think a lot of us have have improved over the years. Uh, That's fair. When when we uh, talk about improvement, I, I I mean, I think you you're honestly expected to evolve, right? A, a, an individual craftsman is is expected to as our as our manufacturers and to your credit you've been in business for over 20 years and I don't know if that would be the case if if you weren't evolving and improving yeah, um, one more controversial topic for you before we uh, before we wrap up I know we're, we're kind of at time here so I, I appreciate you sticking around um, there has been some questions around the the country of origin and so the oh. You know, a lot yeah. of folks will say it's made in China or it's made in India. And when I talk to you or your staff, or <laughs> I guess I haven't heard it from your mouth specifically yet, but yes. your website, your staff say we're, we're made in Canada and, and proud to be so. So uh, yeah. to folks that have that question, what, what <laughs> it's weird to ask you, like, well, what would you say other than it's made in Canada? <laughs> but uh, how would you explain that, hey, that we are making them in Canada? Is there is there anything that you could do to, to quell that that? Uh, open question with some yeah I mean uh, we've done a lot of things I mean we have a lot of uh, YouTube videos um, and Instagram pictures Facebook pictures of the guys in the back forging uh, assembling uh, doing pretty much anything manufacturers you know are expected to do on our home page we have a video a seven minute video I think or 11 minute video basically of the main <clears throat> parts of a forging process you know uh, assembly process um, there's only so much you can do, and there's only so much I'm willing to do for people who simply won't change their minds, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's some people who say that we're made in India and Pakistan and China, um, Darfur Armory and ports. Okay, fine. Um, we don't. We do import some items, yes, the Herald series on our website. Those are swords and armors that are made in India, you know, but those are the Herald series on our website. Then it says, made in India, but those are not the same quality as our swords. I mean, if I send you a Herald series sword, it wouldn't last that disruption test that you've made. It'll last maybe three minutes. Um, they're not the same product, they're not the same price point, they're not the same quality. Uh, second thing is, I mean, you have more experience than I do with other manufacturers and, you know, uh, swords that have been made in uh, China and India and things like that. 
But I mean, especially the criticism about India. I mean, I've seen uh, swords from uh, Indian manufacturers, and like I said, the Herald series swords are made in India. And one thing that's very consistent with Indian swords, whether it's Herald series or it's uh, museum replicas, is the grain structure. I mean, India has a very regular uh, grain structure on their swords. You can you can tell. I mean, if you have an, an eye, a relatively trained eye, you can tell when a sword is made in India without even handling it because of the grain structure, the surface grain uh, the patterns. So it's very easy to determine whether a sword is made in India, China, or Canada, the U.S., and so forth. Um, all you have to look at is the grain, the surface grain. Uh, that's all it is. I mean, if, if they were made in, in India, first of all, if they were made in India, they wouldn't last as much, as long. They wouldn't be as resistant as they are now. Uh, because I haven't come across a company in India that can manufacture something that's as resistant. And if I did come across one, I would build a much bigger company of the dark sort. Um, because obviously, once you're in port, you can reduce the price. It's a loss less of a hassle. You don't have the issue of being out of stock. You can buy volume and stuff like that because companies in India are generally much bigger than our little company here. Um, but um, I, you know, in a way, I'm glad the question came up because it, it is something that I, I wanted to address. But at the same time, there's only so much I can do and show. Because no matter what we do, we'll get criticized for it. You know, initially people said, the critics uh, said, you know, Dark Sword should put out a video showing their production, you know. And they'll never do that because they don't make swords. And then we did that. We put out a production, you know, put it on our website, and the criticism shifted to it's all staged, you know. And I'm thinking it's all staged. Okay, so we got... You know, we have a professional forge, which is like 12 feet long, uh, which costs probably about $10,000. We've got five blacksmiths, you know, uh, making blades, you know, bladesmiths. Um, we got power hammers. We have about 200 hammers in the shop. We have all the equipment. We have the grinders and everything, so basically everything is staged, and we just got this overnight, and the guys are trained overnight to become bladesmiths. I mean, you know, it's like the logic for me, kind of like... But after a while, you know, again, um, what's important really is that you just put out the best product you can, and the criticism will come. You yeah. know, it's... It's it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. I don't I don't understand where it comes from, you know. And I have seen on Sword Buyer's Guide, I have seen someone who posted um, a link, basically showing that there are, there were some weapons, some swords coming from India to Dark Sword Armory. And it's like, yes, two things about that. Number one, yes, we do import from India the Herald series, and it's up on our website. You know, that's number one. Number two. I think there's a lot of people, most people are uh, pretty aware because they made a big thing on online about the lawsuit we had against uh, three companies in India who were not just stealing our designs, but actually making counterfeit with our logo. And these swords, actually, we after three years, battling for three years in courts, we finally got those seized and we have them in our shop and we're selling them on our sale page. And all of the money that we're making off those swords, we're basically giving away to the Animal Rescue Network. Um, but what we're doing is that we're grinding off our logo off of them first. So these people ripped off our two-handed Norman sword, our discount sword, um, the uh, two-handed uh, Oslo Viking sword, and the 15th century sword. Um, you know, those are the swords we were able to get back. Uh, prior to having that company shut down in India, because the lucky thing, the lucky thing, was that in India they have the same laws as in Canada, so the civil code and uh, Canada and in uh, in India is the same, uh, because it's based on the British uh, code. So um, when people tell you that uh, emulation is the highest form of flattery, you, you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> yes, ripping off though. <laughs> 
I mean, I would I would never make a Ford and put somebody else's logo on it and say yes, it's made by that manufacturer. And I've seen it, you know, I've uh, I've seen uh, swords made in India because I mean, we constantly get emails from Indian manufacturers with their catalog, and I've seen numerous times uh, other manufacturers' products being ripped off, not with the logo, but the design. You know, I've seen it from Albion, and I have sent them a link saying, hey, guys, you know, here's this manufacturer, and this is one of your models. Uh, so I have notified a couple of uh, manufacturers whenever I do see that, and I'm hoping that other manufacturers do the same because we have to look out for each other for these type of things. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, Indian-made products. Like, I'm not one to crap on uh, museum replicas because I think that they still offer a good quality slash price ratio but there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and if you're looking for a decorative piece you certainly don't need to spend 400 or 500 dollars not to say that museum replica is purely decorative but i mean there's no point i mean there's sufficient space for everyone to be in the business and not having to argue about a piece of the territory or whatever it is uh but i'm kind of kind of going away from the question here um so it's it's just very strange for me to um, kind of understand where this is coming from because it's nothing that we're hiding. I mean, we're not hiding the fact that, yes, we do import from India, but it's not the Dark Sword line with the Herald series, and one should not be mixed up with the other. It, and we it also like they, they aren't, it, it, to, your, to your credit. You're saying that products from India aren't bad. You like them enough to sell them. And you're very For clear. Product. You're very clear yeah. about which products are from India mm -hmm. and which ones are not. Uh, the the question around are all of your products made not in Canada? You know, pick your pick your poison of where okay. India seems to be the most common thought. I mean, I, I could see if I held up a museum replicas versus one of one of your products or something from Windless. Uh, they are both shiny. Um, I, I don't know that I see the same similarities personally, but. I'm not making the argument here. And if you're looking as a manufacturer for ways to to kind of proof in the pudding and you feel you've done that, I, I don't know that I have a, a, a you know, a, a solution to present to you. I don't know, a live webcam yeah. and like, hey, look, I've made the sword. You know, I, yeah. if you've already taken steps to, to address that and they remain, um, you're, you're in a better position to answer the question of are they warranted and is there anything you can do to, to empathize with those critics and try to understand what they're saying and, and address that concern or is it just not worth your time? It sounds like um, you've already done some stuff, but so it, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's always worth your time because ultimately it's your company, your reputation, and who you are as a person. Um, there's a difference between owning a manufacturing plant where you're just putting out a product that's just on a, you know, kind of conveyor belt or whatever and just popping them out as opposed to do some, something that's really artistic. Um, you know, when you're doing something artistic and you're proud of it, you know, it's it's your name, it's your reputation, it's, it's a lot more, it's more personal. Um, and that's why, you know, and that's why I take the whole customer service issue very seriously. Um, so I'm kind of baffled by certain criticism about it when, you know, I hope my customers know that you can contact us directly. Um, and that's why there's a card, which I'm sure you also got with the Alexandria sword, about the warranty, you know, clearly yeah. stating. Well, I keep an eye on the YouTube comments for this video. I'm sure some people yeah. will chime yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm certain. I am certain because, I mean, you know, like I said, you know, after 25 years of business and, um, you know, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. But, um, you know what, in terms of, um, I'm kind of at a loss in terms of why exactly this uh, China or India thing keeps on coming uh, forward. Because if you have any experience with uh, pieces that are made in India, and you hold, like, for example, in your case, you know, if you hold the Alexandria sword, because I, I assume that that's the only um, experience you've had with Dark Sword. Um, no, I, I did a, a review, uh, it was a long time ago, kind of when I started doing it, and I like to think that the, the content has gotten marginally more educated, though still probably have a long way to go, um, but I did a review some time ago on one of the earlier products, and it had 
an, an earlier version of, of your logo on it, so I, I'd have to look up oh. exactly which one it was. Uh, but Michael, I think, actually saw it, and when when the request came in to send me the uh, Alexandria sword, uh, the seeing of that review and and kind of my thoughts on it, criticism seemed to seemed to strike uh, strike a chord, and so that was I think yeah. part of what instigated is that I, I had reviewed something. In fairness, though, this is the first time I've had a new product from Dark Sword. The previous sword I had was secondhand, as are many of the swords I, I get, because I am operating on a limited budget, and the secondhand market is a little more reasonable. Um, so there's there's always that variation of what did the person before me do. To to your point, some people take mm -hmm. an angle grinder, some people sharpen it, modify it, beat it against a tree, um, and you know I, I can speculate based on what I see, but I never know for sure what what rigors the swords have been put through prior to prior to me getting them, and I do my best to note that. Um, so this one coming directly from you after after having, you know, obviously being a prototype, obviously having some some handled uh, time, uh, was still probably the closest to new that I've, I've had from Dark Sword Armory. And I haven't had many, because my, most of my uh, my ramblings tend to be around uh, non-European swords, but I'm, I'm obviously, I've, I've gone off the deep end on everything sharp and shiny lately, so. <laughs> But still, uh, yes, one of the, the earlier pieces from, or the, one of the first pieces new from Dark Sword Armory. And I, I do see some similarities in that you put a higher sheen or a higher polish on your blades yeah. than, uh, than many other European manufacturers do. There's often a, a kind of a satin polish, and it's not yeah. necessarily more or less historic either way. There's certainly a, a preference, though. The shinier is, mm -hmm. is cooler to me. I like shiny things. Um, and the, yeah. the, the fittings on yours are shiny as well. You, you tend to put a buff on things. Uh, the tool marks under, like it seems like they are ground and there are tool marks and then it's put under what looks like a, a buffing wheel or something to really give it a yeah. high polish. But the, it obviously hasn't gone through, you know, 12 belt sanders to refine every, it's a high no. belt and then, and then a buffing wheel. I'm guessing, mm. speculative on my part. A couple of belts and a buffing wheel, absolutely, yes. So. Uh, and those are similar to, to Windless in terms of what, what I've seen. Right. I've had a few products from them. Um, both of your products, at least the, the Alexander, I think, is a, is a different case. That that to me felt, well, you know what I felt because I rambled about it for a half hour on the Internet. But uh, uh, it, it didn't feel cumbersome. It didn't have the same weight distribution. It wasn't as, as hefty as the pieces that I've had uh, from Windless or, or Indian companies. It seemed to have a, a different type of refinement, though visually, I mean, if you look at them at a distance, there were similarities in terms of that they that they were both shiny. Um, mm. That said, uh, the the previous Dark Sword Armory sword that I remember reviewing was was quite a bit thicker and maybe had a few more similarities. But I, I mean, this this is I don't make them right. I've <laughs> I can barely <laughs> sharpen them. So my observations are just that of. Here's how they're. Here's how they look from the outside. Here's what a, a naked eye or a camera can pick up, uh, and I don't know that that I could tell you what steel is made in China or what steel is made in India. There's there's just different observations about how different companies make them, and and that becomes easier to to discern the manufacturer rather than uh, to your eye as as a maker. If you're looking at grain structure, I I couldn't look at a sword and tell you the steel grain structure must be this or that. In fact, I can never tell even what steel it's made from. I'll usually quote and say, this is supposed to be made from this, but I I don't have a way of telling you for sure if it, it could, you know, I can tell you it's not made of Play-Doh. I mean, it's made out of steel, but what kind? I I don't know. Mm -hmm. You could make up a steel and I'd be like, it's made of that. I, I have no way of validating that. Yeah. What I can validate though is, here's how ripply the surface steel is, and, and that's symptomatic of of this or that manufacturer. Or here's the, the process by which it was manufactured, at least as I can tell, there's there's a low grip belt and then a buffing wheel because it's shiny, but it's it's got surface scratches underneath that shine. Um, so th there's things like that, and I, I I suppose I can see some similarity in that regard, but I, I certainly could tell you if they were made in India, or Canada, or China, or your backyard, or if you I can tell you you're not making them in my garage because I've been home for a month, and you haven't been in there. <laughs> but other than that, I, I don't I don't know where any of it is made, mm -hmm. and I don't know uh, because I I haven't seen it. And if it, the, I think the spirit of the question kind of says that your products are similar in some some regard enough that makes somebody question. Um, 
whether that question is like off the deep end conspiracy theory or, or genuine customer concern that you may be losing business to, I, I don't know. But uh, I suppose enough people ask the question of me that it, it seems a, a dubious yeah. point in the minds of some of your critics. And uh, what you could do to, to quell that criticism is, is not something I have a great answer for, other than like you could walk through start to finish. You know, I, there's a lot of YouTube channels that do that, but I suppose you, you'd face a new line of criticisms immediately after. So I, what's worth your time? I can't answer. Probably, probably, but it's, uh, I think that it's really difficult as a manufacturer um, to do that, uh, especially when you make production batches. Um, but um, I will say that. I mean, you know, our doors are always open. Uh, we have visits pretty much during the summer, probably not this summer, but we always have people visiting our shop during the summertime and they see us work, stuff like that. It's like, our doors are pretty much open. Um, in terms of why, again, why um, some people believe that our swords are made in India or China, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, the we make them the way we make them. I think they're different from other manufacturers in some aspects of it. I think if they were made in China or India, we'd see them on a bunch of different <laughs> retailing websites because, I mean, uh, China doesn't restrict itself from stealing other people's designs and selling them off and things like this, So, or selling their own customers' uh, products to other people. So I, I don't think that that's limited um, to that. I don't know that that's necessarily. I mean, I understand. I I work in an industry where uh, where some of that theft is is common. But in the sword realm, I mean, I'll I'll look at example um, Hanway. They make European style swords, and I I won't I won't press you to talk about any other manufacturer. I, I would just note that from my personal buying experience, it seems like uh, many of their swords don't. You know, th there certainly are copies. There are people that use similar fittings or, or, or copy some of some of those designs and they do happen. But by and large I don't see a, a huge amount of other retailers selling counterfeit Hanway products. And maybe it's just because yeah. I'm completely blind and I, I can't see what's in front of my face. But by and large I, I mean I will see the occasional eBay listing where, where some high end design from that company is kind of being ripped off and sold for a hundred dollars by this one and the mm -hmm. you know completely uh, uneducated consumer may mistake uh, may mistake them, but generally speaking, I would say that I don't see a lot of copies of the the Hanway Tinker line or uh, the you yep. know ver various other types of commonly sold products from from a Chinese manufacturer. They seem to have a, a pretty good handle on it. I, I certainly have seen a fair share of copying, though. I mean, <laughs> there there are incidents where where you know that that type of theft happens, and it's unfortunate when it does, but. Um, it doesn't seem to be as systemic as, you know, if you made it in China, you would expect Dark Sword Armory to be sold at, you know, Walmart <laughs> yeah. as some sort of copy. Um, yeah. But you would probably, in fairness, know more about that than I would because you're, you're looking out for it quite, probably quite a bit more than I am. Speaking of, uh, you know, kind of impacts to business, I'm, I'm curious on, a, on maybe a heavier or lighter note. Uh, mm -hmm. How has the the pandemic, the the craziness happening in the world around us right now, impacted Dark Sword Armory? Uh, well, it's more about staff than anything else. I mean, uh, we're under government restrictions, so we're working with uh, limited staff, which means that our production has come to a stop. We're just focusing on shipping out the orders that we do have in stock. Um, so pretty much all day. All first of all, we're working with uh, much reduced staff. We're only three here during the week. And uh, all we do is uh, polish, sharpen, pack, ship. That's all. Uh, production has come to a complete stop. Um, right now, the government has mentioned something about the 14th of May, uh, gradually reopening businesses. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, but other than that, I mean, you know, it's, uh, we just continue. I mean, uh, we have no choice. Um, yeah, I'm, you know. Um, and not not to ask you a question that may you know reveal more than you want but i'm i'm curious there was a mad rush on toilet paper and I, depending on when somebody watches this video uh the pandemic may may still be in full swing or or hopefully will be will be long gone um but i'm curious how that affects swords are there are there mad dashes for toilet paper and gosh what what else soap and toilet paper masks um yeah and yeah, you yeah. can't buy chicken anywhere 
Uh, that's yeah. that's what okay. I'm seeing in my area. Are, are people just like, I need a sword too, like swords and toilet yeah. paper, or? Absolutely. I mean, we we do feel that that kind of rush urgency to get the swords and our sales in in all frankness, yes, our sales have gone up a little bit because of this. Um, and I think it's because people are realizing that they're going to be stuck at home for a big part of the summer. You know, we can't travel. You can only stay in the same cities. I don't know about, you know, where you are, but parks are closed down. You can get fined for walking in a park. Um, so I think a lot of members of the Backyard Cutting Society, you know, they're kind of like subculture. They kind of want to like, okay, well, you know, I'd like to do some cutting tests during the summer. At least I'll be in my backyard, do something I enjoy. Or, you know, something like that. I mean, obviously, I can't know exactly why our sales up during this period, but uh, that's what I assume. So, Yes, it has had, um, I guess, a positive uh, impact on sales. Uh, well, that's you know, it's a, it's a say. it's a curious thing. Toilet paper and swords. I would not. Yeah. I, I <laughs> thought you would probably be able to provide some insight in that because there are certainly things that have gone down significantly in sales. Um, and there's a lot of people. I mean, as as effectively you think about a sword, it's not. Um, Arguably not a necessity, right? Uh, you could yeah. describe it as yeah. as an adult toy, not in the you know sexual way. <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah, yeah. it's really uh, uh, kind of a luxury item, and so it is. unlike toilet paper and uh, and food, it is it is certainly up to your discretionary income, which a lot of people don't have. So I find it fascinating that that sales would go up. Well, it's it's well, at least a good problem for you to have. Unfortunately, you can't make them right now, but it's it's at yeah. least a a good problem amongst many <laughs> many not good problems well the uh the last bit I, I suppose i'll have is just what's dark sword armory looking forward to do in the future Where, where's uh where's dark sword armory going to be in the next five years any fun exciting projects or cool things you'd like to share with uh well um there's going to be a couple of things um number one this year uh i mean we put out quite a few new models last year uh, and this was kind of a buildup of about two or probably two years working on the designs. And then last year we finally put them in production. Um, this year I want to slow down with creating new designs. And I just want to take a step back and kind of tweak certain things in order to make improvements. Um, not only aesthetic improvements, like we started, for example, if you look at the Medieval Night Sword 1306. Uh, if you look at that sword, you'll notice that the pommel has changed from like six months ago, and the blade too. Um, so kind of made like aesthetic improvements on that aspect of it. So I just kind of want to take a step back and make improvements in terms of quality, but also in terms of aesthetic improvements on some of our products instead of putting out more designs uh, this year. Uh, second thing I'm kind of looking into is... I wanted to launch this last year, but just lack of time. Um, Dark Short is going to start selling antiques. So we're going to start selling uh, authentic pieces, armors, swords, um, things like that. So uh, it's going to be tied to our website. That's something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I'm really looking forward to launch that. Um, there's a very big project coming up. But I'm just, I'm going to tease you guys and I'm not going to tell you what it's about because I want it to be a surprise. Uh, but people are going to love it. Um, but that's probably, this project is probably going to be out around December or so. Um, there's still a lot to do. I'm not going to mention anything, but it's, gonna, it's going to be interesting. And I think at least the Dark Lord fans will be really happy with this upcoming project. Um, well, that, that's pretty much it for now. I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, I can't speak of what's going to happen in 15 months or so. This is for kind of the near foreseeable future. We can, well, none of us could say what will happen in 15. Yeah, I don't exactly. know what's going to happen in two weeks. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the short-term plan, until December uh, 2020, that that's pretty much it. So we're, we're going to have a collection of antiques that are going to be sold on our website. We're going to have this new project that I'm going to be working that I've already started working on, but there's a lot of implementation to be done. But I also want to take a step back. Like, for example, after you did your review of the Alexandria sword, 
we did take a step back to kind of say, hmm, that's true. You know, the swords do rattle a little bit in the scabbards. So we've kind of already made uh, adjustments in that by putting a small, very thin liner at the tip of the scabbards prior to uh, gluing them uh, the, the evening before. So I want to take a little step back like that, kind of tweak little, certain little things. And then when manufacturer is open again, um, I am going to contact the casting company to show them the video and kind of have a discussion with the tech agents and see what exactly can be done in order to improve that, you know, the elasticity of um, the steel. So, uh, yeah, I, I would send you the pieces if they didn't fly off into the pond behind my house. But. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a laugh when I saw that. It reminded me of golf, just like. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it happened the first time, and I was like, "All right, well, if I do it this way, then it it should and it bounced off the tree and flew in the same spot." It's, I think I edited out my fuck. Which is, it's, it's, yeah, that that was kind of what immediately followed. But it was yeah. it was a good time. I, I do appreciate your uh, one your time for you know ta taking the time and chatting and rambling with me about swords. It's been a good time. Uh, and for sending me the the sample to review, it was a it was a good time. It was a fun sword, and unfortunately, it it's it hasn't survived. But um, one other odd odd bit you may be interested in uh, about this particular sword is I've never had a broken sword that so many people have asked me to buy. So as a marketing option, a lot of people have wanted to buy this broken sword and said, Matt, what are you what are you going to do with it? What can I buy it? Can I buy it from you? That nobody has ever seen me break a sword and then be like, you know what I want? That busted piece of shit. That's what I, that's never happened before. Some people have asked about like the pieces. They might, you know, and I'll send them off to. Well, it, it's all sorts of things that'll do. But I, I, I'm usually inspired when people can breathe new life into them or use them as forging practice or if they if they're beneficial in in some way to somebody else. But and that's what this one will do. Somebody had a, a plan that compelled me, so it will it will see new life again in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but I, I just thought it was funny that a lot of people asked me about buying this broken sword. So even in its busted state, it still has marketable value. That's <laughs> so that that might be your your future project. Hopefully, I didn't spoil your secret spoiler for December, where it's going to be a, a new line of broken swords from Dark Sword Armory. I hope I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Ouch! Damn it! <laughs> sorry, sorry if I stole your thunder there. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. It's been a good time. Thank you for the sword. Thank you for uh, your time. And, and that's all I have. Is there anything before we, you know, I, I know we're 30 minutes overdue and I, I appreciate that, uh, that you'd like to add uh, before we, we call it here? No, actually, you know what? Um, the only thing, uh, please, um, if you have any points that you would like to see improvements on at Dark Sword, uh, please write them in the description. I would love to read them. Um, I know what aspects I would like to improve on our pieces. Uh, constantly looking to improve, uh, but I'd like to get everybody's point of view, feedback. Um, and also the people who have watched the video and you know really believe that they're made in China, please let me know why. Um, I don't know what else to do in order to show you that it's Canadian product. Um, but I would I would like to get your point of view, other than just say they're lying, it's made in China, India, whatever it is. I'd like to know what is it that makes you believe. I mean, if you think that my swords are the same thing as uh, museum replica in terms of quality, okay. Um, I have a couple of museum replicas. I don't think that's the case, but that's my point of view. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I would really like to hear people's comments and um, hear about what they think about it. And um, again, don't be shy to email us directly as well. And uh, for those of you who made the comment that they had some sort of problem with customer service, email, email us, please. Um, whether it's you want to do it public on Facebook, that's good as, as well. Um, if not, just contact us directly. Um, you can ask to speak to me. I'm always at the shop. Um, cause I, I really am honestly surprised to hear that, um, some people did not get the service that they should have, or maybe they just assumed that we would replace them because they have made changes, uh, modifications to the blade, but that's not the case. Rest assured, 
once you buy a sword from us, you know, whether it's like five years ago, I don't care. Um, we're here. And, you know, that's the reason we've been here for so long. Uh, you know, and it's really important for, for me. It's important for us uh, that people are happy with our products. And, uh, that's what we do them for. It's a, it's, it's a product that comes out of passion. It's not a commodity that we make to make money. You know, if that was the case, I'd make toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. I make a lot of my toilet paper. <laughs> so uh, that's, all, that's all it is. I mean, you know, I, I really, I can't be more honest than that. Uh, just let us know so whatever, whatever you comment, feelings, whatever. Well, let us you, know. sir, have solicited the, uh, you know, uh, the direct comments from YouTube as, as Dark Sword Armory. So I, I don't doubt yeah. that people will not be, uh, I don't doubt that people will be very forthcoming with their questions and or complaints. So uh, just keep an eye on the comment section here and uh, and hopefully with what's said, it doesn't get turned off. <laughs> I won't certainly do it, but uh, YouTube has a way of, of uh, yeah. mitigating that sometimes. Anyway, uh, thank you again for your time. I, I you. appreciate the the follow up and and soliciting people to to reach out to you, and uh, and that's all I have. Anyway, again, thank uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Really appreciate it. All right, well, that's all I got. Special thanks to Dark Sword Armor Yell in particular for taking the time to talk to me today. I much appreciate it. I hope you found the conversation, the chat, the interview entertaining or informative in some way, shape, or form. Anyway, there will be links in the description down below, again, to the Dark Sword Armory destruction test and review that I did on that particular sword, as well as their website and a few other bits and bobs that I can find. That's all I've got for you. I hope you enjoyed. Cheers, and thanks for watching.